it's really a um, a challenge to run this session. It was an idea that we've discussed between, you know, Leslie, Aaron, and me for quite a while to actually look at, you know, the negative results of our activities, of our projects. And it's a, it's a very sensitive issue, a very sensitive topic. Uh, people do not want to talk about what hasn't worked, where, where they failed to achieve what they had it up out for. And so, you know, we, we're going to try to encourage a sort of new structure to exchange about this. You know, nobody should feel intimidated to say if something didn't work. I don't know if any funders are in the room, which causes usually more distress about these issues, but even they, I think, need to be engaged much more in opening up towards acknowledging, appreciating the fact that things sometimes don't work the way they were planned to, to work, and that we can benefit from the lessons that come out of this. So that's what basically this session is about. Um, whoops, why doesn't this, uh, I guess I need to use a little arrow here. No, and it still doesn't, no. Okay, so um, for this session, I have a few introductory slides about that. Um, most of it I already said, I think. And then we wanna actually get going with a discussion and engaging everybody here on defining what does failure mean in, in the context of Earth and space science informatics and data repositories and software development and so on. Because there are many different aspects and maybe you know we, we're not even using the right term. It's not a failure necessarily. There are challenges that we can't overcome. Uh, there are obstacles in the way, there is a changing ecosystem, a changing landscape of data that impacts the projects that we have. So let's define what we're actually talking about here. Um, and, and there are obviously also different types of things that don't work. A software that doesn't work is something different from a project that falls apart because the investigator goes into retirement, or so sustainability has not been achieved and so on. So let's try to you know, have a discussion among all the people here. Uh, and we're trying to set up a bit of, um, uh, yeah, a system that everybody can write that down, what you think about, and put that up on post-its notes here around the room so we can gather your input in a, in a more uh, comprehensive way. And then we thought that the three organizers should take the first step and confess of what they've done wrong and where, where their efforts have gone astray and didn't end up where they were supposed to end up. So uh, we're gonna take a deep breath and, and do that and feel embarrassed and uh, let's, let's discuss these, um, in these aspects, but then there is an open invitation for any of you to come. And if you don't want to show your face, uh, you hide behind the <laughs> behind something. But I, I, I think this, you know, if if anybody is in this room who wants to uh, take it bad on people, you better leave. This is supposed to be a safe environment for anybody to let go and say what hasn't worked and, and, and step forward. I think the only way for us to change the culture is to have it come from ourselves and, and participate in this. And we want to end up this session with discussing uh, how we can actually move forward and make this, you know, should this be an ongoing effort of gathering the stories of things that didn't work? How can we best learn from it? How can we share these experiences? And how can we further trigger that culture change and create different incentives to report negative results or failures rather than just brag about all our successes? Um, I've used this in, in a lecture last year, and I, I really think uh, it is a very wise uh, statement, and Confucius has said a lot of very wise things, but studying the past, 
we can define the future. And studying the past is not only looking at the big successes that we have had, but looking at what didn't work. And whoops, um, I think this this was also a very or very nicely captures what we're trying to do here. Failing and recognizing that we failed is an attempt to learn and to move forward. And, and that's, again, is what we want to do here. But negative results have largely stayed a, an untouched matter. But I've also seen, you know, going over the last few days online and looking at uh, other disciplines, um, they deal with negative results much better than we do. Engineering, for example, is very open about failures in what they have built because lives depend on that. The same in clinical research and in pharmaceutical research. They have journals that publish negative results and failures. So, you know, it's just examples where we can think about what, um, what we might want to do. Uh, for me, it's uh, the first time I actually thought about this was when I read this and, oh, I'm sorry that I covered up part of, of the title page here, from this um, workshop report on understanding infrastructure that has been sort of my mantra, my Bible for, for the last uh, 12 years now, written by Paul Edwards and colleagues. And when they came to their final recommendations from this workshop on building infrastructure, um, they clearly stated that there is so much anecdotal evidence of things that worked and didn't work, and that we need to accommodate and encourage honest reporting of failure that could bring us a long way in supporting long-term and comparative learning across varieties of cyber infrastructure experiences. So again, this is, um, I think, important. So with that, I wanted to start asking you all to contribute in defining what we're talking about. What do you think of when you think a project has failed? And Erin, you want to distribute the pieces of paper or can we? Yeah. <laughs> oh, this is probably that microphone that didn't work we before. Do. <laughs> we, do have we do have externals on. Oh, yeah. We, we actually Let's do try have it. a oh, number of works. externals okay. on. Um, so I'm curious. I mean, to me, when I'm when I was thinking about what I was going to say about failure, um, you know, it's it's more of a systemic, it wasn't the project failed, but it's kind of how we've approached the project is not working. Um, so I wonder other thoughts just quickly around the room of failure. Why are you here? There's a lot of you here. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, two quick thoughts. Failure can mean um, that there were project objectives defined up front that weren't satisfied. Um, now, failure could also be, and I could point to a, an example of this later, but part of the failure was not having project objectives clearly laid out to begin with, you know, but and, and then failing or a double fail. But the other thing I'll go ahead and toss out right away is it's not a full failure if you learn from the experience and are able to apply lessons learned to future activities. So just to get that thought out, which is an obvious one, but yeah. to get that out early, that um, it's not it's not a complete failure if you learn useful information right. from right. it. Just like they're saying with the uh, space program, failure could be good if it happens early <laughs> <laughs> rather than when you've got people on board, right. for example. No, that's absolutely right. And I, so, that's why I actually said, you know, do, can we come up with a better term for this? 
maybe in, in many cases it's not a failure. It's challenges that couldn't be overcome or that have come in the way. Um, the same is it's not negative results. That's very often in research you have negative results. You ruled out a hypothesis because your tests uh, showed that. That's not entirely applicable to what we're talking about here. And, and so, you know, I would be happy for suggestions to actually define, uh, I think you all understand what we want to, to discuss here, uh, but what's, I, I haven't been able to come up with a better terminology. Uh, and just a, a corollary to, oh, sorry, I'm John Ralph from NCEI and a corollary to previous comments was well, sometimes you define the project up front and what you get is exactly what you asked for and that's not what you wanted at all. Um, and, and we've seen that in, you know, uh, especially with uh, contract things where you, you pay somebody to develop something where what you finally get isn't what you need at all. So failure, so we're going here, 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 here. How can we? There's a um, another perspective to failure, which is from a project management or a funder perspective, which I would argue yeah. is uh, that's when objectives are not met or deliverables are not delivered uh, on a you know within budget, uh, within a particular time frame, and nor do they necessarily meet the scope that was initially laid out. So those could all be viewed potentially as failures, although there are often ways to mitigate uh, some of those uh, problems. Steve, Steve, did you have a, a failure coming back here? Um, I don't know how relevant this is, but so I was on a panel, my name is Steve Uso from the New York College of Science. <clears throat> I was on a panel on replicability at NIH, and um, there, con there was this conclusion that nearly 80% of the um, uh, experiments that were done under NIH's tutelage were not replicable. And that implicated uh, science and nature. Uh, so the report that came out of this, a summary of it was sent to science for publication and they rejected it. So that's, that's sort of my sort of take on systemic failure. So I guess being rejected might be another, like when have we been rejected? Yeah. Proposal failures. There's um, Ruth also. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I was. Sorry. Oh. Sorry. Sorry. You can go first. You can go first. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So I was thinking that an iteration by nature is a failure, and from a software development perspective, agile development it supports failure you do an iteration you get rapid feedback it wasn't quite what you expected and then you go back and do it again taking what you've learned so another word here could even be iteration or evolution ruth i think just one so, sorry, Ruth. Um, I, I guess what comes to mind when I think of failure are things that could, could have and should have been prevented. So failures in process or failures in communication where there's, you know, we should know better. If only we were just to talk to one another a little bit better, you know, something could have been avoided or prevented. And that to me is are always the head smack. Ah, I should have done that better. Sure, I'm Emily Sila Glassman from NASA. I think for me, failure where it kind of crosses the line from something fizzling out to failure is also where where you know that one party's been really disappointed. Like there, there's this emotional aspect to it that you have failed some partner or some end user or someone that invested like time and hope in something. Yeah. That's a good one. Okay. So I think there's oh. a there's a piece here that keeps getting repeated, in which there's Failure is, seems to be unexpected. So there's an unexpected aspect of failure, like you didn't see it coming and now you're here. And the other thing for me, like failure for me is like big. It's like, oh, I spent too much money. That's one kind of fail, but I just killed somebody. 
you know, with my car, that's a fail or whatever, right? Like, like, like there's big kinds of fails. Like it's way beyond specs or requirements. Like, wow, we didn't see that coming and now somebody's hurt. That's a, that's a big fail. Um, okay, so I'm probably totally off the wall here because I was actually thinking of instances rather than here's, you know, definitions. And so I had an epic uh, instance failure <laughs> in that here I am, a data manager. I got a grant for a project. Um, at the time I was at NSIDC, infinite disk space. I figured no sweat. And then I moved to a different organization in the middle of the project that had no resources at all. And, and so I'm sitting here going, now what do I do with my data? And it was about a terabyte. And at that time, I could not for the life of me find a place to put it. And it was on Amazon. And then people started using it at the 40 bucks an hour rate when my grant was over. And, and I, it took me like eight hours to figure that out. And I panicked and deleted it. Yeah. I think another aspect of failure is if you build something or create something and then you have no plan to communicate about it and so nobody knows about it, which I think sometimes happens is that people are building amazing tools and websites and ways to access data, but nobody actually knows that they exist. So that can be part of the failure process. I I don't want to monopolize, but I love talking about failure, having you know plenty of experience uh, during my long checkered career. But um, to me, uh, it, I'll give it a specific instance and, and then draw something from it. Um, one failure that came to my mind, you know, personal failure was circa mid '80s. Some colleagues and I were looking at artificial intelligence, and we were thinking wow, you know, this AI has a lot of potential and we should be exploring this technology, you know, because so-called expert systems, rule-based systems clearly could help people comply with environmental regulations. And this neural network thing sounds really powerful. You know, you could do some really interesting things with neural networks. So we launched a project that with hindsight I recognize is we were playing with the emerging technologies, but we hadn't clearly defined project objectives. And um, we wound up spending not, not a whole lot of money and not a whole lot of people time, but, but essentially we did stuff that with hindsight was kind of an evolutionary dead end. That if we'd had project objectives laid out, we might have at least written a project report afterwards, you know, that said, what have we learned from this? You know, are, are, there, are there some things that people might want to pick up after, after us? But the, a couple of related points, you know, you can look at technology and you can try to prognosticate, this is going somewhere. Like we were right that AI was going to go somewhere, that it was an important technology but we were kind of bumblers ahead of our time in that the technology in the mid 80s wasn't ripe for application. And we were not the kind of people who were going to do a Steve Jobs, you know, and all of a sudden now, now we have something that's marketable or, or, or usable. So I, I think a lesson maybe is to try to understand the evolutionary path. Evolution came up before and to recognize that there are evolutionary dead ends um, where if you're paying attention and you're doing your due diligence, you might be able to anticipate if we do a project in this area, we're wasting our money. If we build a better carburetor um, today, that's not going to be useful because that's an evolutionary dead end technologically. Um, so I, I think that's, that's something else to think about. And also maybe you want to be ahead of your time and be highly exploratory at high risk, but maybe that's actually not appropriate for your milieu and, and, and you want to recognize 
yeah, this has a lot of potential. It's going to be important down the road, but the time is not ripe, you know, for a project in this area. I let let someone else be the pioneer who gets the first arrows or, or whatever. Do you think time is not right is an interesting one to capture? Yeah, and I mean, there's obviously, you know, what you're talking about is sort of the planning stage, the the startup fit, phase where the peer review and panel reviews and so on play a role in evaluating is this technology maybe too uh, immature to, to move forward. Um, I had been thinking more at sort of when you're at the end of the project and say, you know, is, has this gone somewhere? Has it achieved what we set out for it to do? But it's it's an important aspect to get sort of the list of be aware of when you plan something you know are you headed for failure because you haven't taken into account certain aspects i think so you it, it's it's nice that you said that because i mean for me it made me aware that you know you you have to um kind of evaluate your progress i mean your likelihood of success your progress and where you arrived at uh, throughout the duration of, of a project. Yes, uh, Eric. Yeah. So I'd, I'd like to bring up um, uh, cultural risks to projects. I think in particular inter and multidisciplinary projects, um, you know, people have different languages, they have different incentives for the things they want to do, uh, the different communications patterns. Um, and something that, I, that I've read that I think is an interesting um, analysis of, of this um, kind of a situation is um, work of Thomas Finholt from the University of Michigan. And he's published some, uh, some analyses of the network for earthquake engineering simulation and the difficulties that uh, project had early on in getting uh, anything done and getting traction. I think failure is often simply a lack of maintenance. Want to talk about the maintainers? Come to the maintainer session. <laughs> I think that's on Thursday. <laughs> so, as a follow-up to the to that gentleman's uh, talk and and Kirsten yours, you're pointing out that you know when you're going into the planning stages and trying to forecast if you're heading for failure, um, sort of related to that. The New York Times had an article earlier this year. Uh, talking about the need for a failure resume, or perhaps in this community, a failure CV. But <laughs> basically, uh, you know, we all uh, produce our CV or resume of all the things that we've done, the great things that we've done. And this article uh, was advocating that we should also keep a parallel copy or version that is all of the ways that we failed. And the, the motivation for that was um, because, we, you know, when you when you succeed at something, you pat yourself on the back and say, you know, I did a good job, you know, planning was good and everything like that. And then when you fail, you want to forget about it. So with the failure resume, you spend a lot of time, the idea is that you'll spend some time reflecting on that failure and perhaps, you know, preventing future failures, the whole idea that you're learning and growing from it. Joseph Bell from the USGS. Uh, you know, one of the things that I see in our culture is there really isn't enough room for failure, right? It's, you can't take that time to fail and learn. Um, and, and then when you do fail, there's that negative connotation along with it. And I just wonder if I could kick it back to the session moderators and, and ask you what would have resulted in a failed session, right? I mean, you really took me out of my comfort bubble as an audience member when you said, I wanna hear from you and then stopped talking and started handing out. So one of my first instincts was to run. <laughs> um, you know, so if had everybody run out, the, the session would have been a failure. But I'm just kind of curious, you know, what what maybe you, you all would have perceived as a failure to the session. I, I mean, a failure to me would have been an empty room, right? Uh, it would have been a silent room, and coming out without any new information you know and and another big aspect of failure would be to 
have hit a topic that we won't go anywhere. You know, to me, it's really important. I mean, I, I, we set up this session because we think it's an important issue. And, you know, I, I consider this already a success because we have a lot of people. There is already a lot of contribution. And, you know, I want to see an ongoing dialogue about it. So if I cannot achieve that, um, probably it would be a failure as well. One thing that you know, I just wanted to, to bring up, um, some of the considerations that I've had in the past, actually, with respect to failure of cyber infrastructure projects or data projects, um, has been the lack of adoption. And that hasn't been brought up here at all. Uh, that, that to me is one of the biggest failures if you know uh, there's a lot of investment years uh, of work and money and the system is shut down because nobody is using it or it doesn't get its you know integration into a community uh, so i'm gonna yes. give it to corinna because i think she's gonna say something in that respect but that exactly has been going around my mind here the the failure of adoption and um, I think a huge problem is in the early stages of planning that I personally probably can't anticipate all the different skill sets that will be needed. So I can think through the, the cyber infrastructure, but I cannot think through other people's minds. And I'm not a very good communicator. So there's a whole range of skills that this kind of project probably would have needed, but there was never planned for, or there was never any resources for it. And, and it's, it's just very difficult to even approach it because it never needs like a whole person full time for the whole project to, to do the communication or to do the early focus groups or, I mean, the methods are all out there, but I think in our culture, and in our funding model, it's just really, really hard to do these things right. Yeah. And then the failure is no yeah. adoption. Yeah. <laughs> That's yes. So this is kind of a follow up on what um, some people have already been saying, but um, it's not uncommon to, uh, as you're starting a project, to define. Um, your success criteria. And this could be, you know, coming in on schedule, on budget, but it could also include, you know, if you're doing a website, you know, what, what are your expected um, number of hits uh, that, that you expect to get? Um, so, I mean, you can lay all this stuff out. It can be very broad, uh, very diverse, so you know what your, what your goals are, and they may be beyond just the statement of work. Um, and at the end of it, you put together a lessons learned uh, to document so you can use it next time because things don't go right all the time or they don't go optimal. So you have that kind of corporate memory that you can use for subsequently. And I think that's usually viewed uh, in a positive way by any uh, funders because they, you know, they've looked at it and said, all right, um, things may not have gone as well as expected, but you know, you've developed some credibility because you've uh, w willing to share that. You know, the, the other thing that I would offer is um, uh, in San Diego, we've had some uh, uh, project management uh, presentations by someone who does improv uh, largely for a living and also, you know, goes and, you know, gives leadership talks uh, and such. And one of the things he points out is that uh, if you want to succeed, you have to fail. And that in improv, um, his statement is that if you're not, you know, failing at least 20% of the time, things just aren't going well, you know, no audience reaction and all that stuff, then you're not being creative enough that you've got to be willing to put yourself out there. So, you know, there's a certain link to creativity as well uh, when it comes to failure. Building off of um, what was mentioned earlier here, um, in terms of cyber infrastructure, like one thing being no reusable products resulting, no, not even a software or a library or, or even a tool or anything, 
you know, if everything was gone, then that's a real failure. But perhaps even worse would be lack of interest in the idea afterward and making it harder for someone else to actually go and try and do it again correctly without, you know, getting funding and whatever. It's been, the well's been right. poisoned, that's, so to speak. That's a really important point that, you know, an idea has been used up somehow. <laughs> I, I want to suggest a type of epic failure just to throw out, which would be not only did the project, you know, fail in whatever sense, but in doing so, or in spite of the failure, it is not preventing others from following a virtually identical path and also repeating your failure. So. It's really epic if you not only fail, but you enable others to fail after you. Or to try afterwards. Right. So at the other extreme, at the very beginning of the project, if you define objectives that are not achievable, you've actually failed before you've started. Um, it, this is um, building off what some other people have said in the discussion, um, but there are you know, formats for conducting conversations about lessons learned, um, and I, I found them to be useful kind of at uh, granular events, like there's a, a system outage or something, and you can bring people together, and you know there's kind of a process for blameless um, post-mortems of events like that. Some some people call them after-action reports. Um, but you know, the intent is to like learn learn about what happened. If there's you know a process failure or uh, you know it's a hardware failure or so, whatever it was, uh, but that can also be done I think uh, usefully and and I've used this technique um, at the at the end of you know kind of small-scale projects or checkpoints within uh, longer projects. You know, taking a step back and getting people in a room and, uh, you know, explaining the ground rules that we're not here to, to blame people, but we want, want people to bring up things that, you know, first you start with what went well, then you go on to, you know, what were some of the problems we encountered and then what, what could we do to improve things uh, in the next iteration. I, I really like that, that comment. Um, I, I think that this learning from failures, um, is not all that we really want to achieve or that we should think about. I think there's an, an aspect also, can we save a certain project or initiative that's on the verge of failing, right? What can we, because a lot gets thrown out because it's like, oh, that failed, it didn't get to it. And maybe just a little bit of twists and turns to you know, its its outcome at the time might lead to a much, you know, more successful end of the project. So, I, I think that's a really important point to to keep in mind. I think there's there's failures at different levels. So there's particular projects that fail. Um, if you have a larger institution, I'm at a data center. Uh, for that, I worry more about failures of a mission instead of commission. Not that I'm, you know, the particular project isn't doing what I say I'm supposed to do on milestones and deliverables, but just that, you know, are we going in the right direction? Am I backing the right horse? Am I seeing what's coming as the landscape changes? Um, and then there are also failures, I think, of community. Um, and it's already come up, but I think our community in particular has a long track record <laughs> of building things, maybe even building yeah. them well, but things that the users just don't use. We're making, and we do it again and again and again. So something in that process isn't right. And that maybe we need to reflect a little bit on how to break right. that cycle or do it a little bit better or something. Yeah. So, so one of the things too that just kind of popped in my head and been thinking about through the conversation is this aspect of maybe the relation between failure and zero sum or non-zero sum, right? When when it's zero sum and it's on the line, then you know failure means loss, right? Whether it's loss of life because somebody in a crosswalk failed to communicate their presence or the car failed to communicate its 
presence going through or in a sports team most of the time yeah. it's because of communications and then you know one of the things that the survey just recently went through was a uh, large data logger failure and um, basically the the loggers had hit a time limit in the code and shut down and there was no idea what happened right so initial thoughts were some type of hack some type of large system failure crashing and really it was just communication right there was no communication that on this day at this time this logger was going to go out of service because of a date entered into the code and so you know somebody had mentioned it earlier and i what i've seen so important is communication because when there's no communication it results in failure Well, I think maybe it's, I mean, I've, I've already heard some initial confessions of the end of things, but, and I've, I I want to move on to, whoops, uh, actually starting to talk about some you know, skeletons in the closet that we, that we can bring out. Um, and as I said, uh, you know, Aaron, Leslie, and myself are willing to admit to some uh, things that have gone wrong. Um, but when you, as I said, we wanted to invite everybody to contribute that. And I would strongly advise that we do it in the first place we talk about our own failures. I think it's really um, not clear how we can move forward with talking about what we consider others failures but we don't want to you know really create a um an atmosphere of blaming of, of finger pointing and so on so that's why i would like to to really encourage everybody to talk about what they feel did not go the way they wanted it to go um if you feel for it i'm not sure how many people we can actually motivate to do that. Um, and we we clearly want to also leave some time, as I said, at the at the end to, to talk about how we can continue this dialogue beyond this session and and uh, how we can create a structure that helps us learn from these confessions in in, in some way. Um, so with that, should I go ahead? So um, and it's interesting um, having heard all these different perspectives on what failure can mean. So um, for those of you who don't know me, um, I have been uh, directing a data facility, AIDA, the Interdisciplinary Earth Data Alliance. And I want to talk about its failure in uh, fulfilling expectations from the funding agency. Uh, I think when we, when I go um, back to 2009, we were invited by the National Science Foundation here in the US uh, to uh, merge a whole set of different projects. It was about 12 different projects to merge them into one proposal uh, for a five-year operation under a cooperative agreement with NSF. So they really wanted to convert a series of uh, individual awards uh, into a community-based facility. And it was intended as a multidisciplinary facility with different, I mean, it's all solid earth sciences, but different subdomains in the facility uh, to continue operating and maintaining these disciplinary systems, um, but also modifying its architecture to provide more integrated um, services, more um, integrated access to, to the data holdings, and develop other tools that serve across all these different communities. And so in general, I think that AIDA has been incredibly successful. And there's a list of, you know, what I consider the success of AIDA to be. It has wide ranging adoption in the community. It's, it's grown data holdings substantially. Services have come up that are new and innovative. It, uh, we can demonstrate impact on science through citations that have been increasing over years. Um, and and an, a huge network of collaborations that we have built. Um, but we have gone through a lot of challenges and they've led, I think, to what is now coming up the end of AIDA. 
So um, that's my uh, <laughs> confession in, in, uh, uh, in this context. So I think the challenges that we've seen were in continuously growing expectations, and this is partly uh, the whole landscape changing. You know, when we started in 2010, there was no core trust sealed certification. There were, uh, you know, a lot of um, a lot less expectations of opening up uh, services, web services, APIs, and so on. And all this has happened at a time when our budget has not only stayed stagnant, but has declined. And I think this is something that many of the facilities are actually going through. But then there have been tensions in the management, and this is something clearly difficult to admit that we weren't able to overcome these tensions that had to do with bringing these different projects initially into one organizational structure where everybody was fighting for the needs of their particular system. So there were fights about the budget, you know, are we going to invest into this particular disciplinary system versus, you know, uh, the overarching shared services, the integrated catalog, and so on. Who are we hiring? Whose expertise are we, do we need? There were different needs in the different groups within this. And, you know, everybody was trying to somehow make the systems most useful for the scientific community. Uh, but as I said, the landscape was changing that we needed to ensure trustworthy operations. And again, with declining budgets that caused a lot of tensions, where do we invest and so on. And then we had the challenge that um, there was a new name on the on the landscape, AIDA. Nobody knew AIDA, uh, but people knew EarthChem, people knew the Marine Geoscience Data System. And so it was, who do we actually market out there who and and we lost advocacy within the agency within nsf where we had very close connections to program managers before that because it moved to a different um structure and was aida now there was less interest in in uh, supporting uh, the effort so the failure was we we did not achieve the increased efficiency. The merger did not lead to the expected economies of scale. Um, we needed additional resources to just uh, coordinate and align the activities in the different groups uh, and establish more common practices and policies and so on. And the other aspect was that project management required a, a, a that was required because our budget went so high up by merging all these different projects together. Uh, the budget actually went exponentially up for the project management as compared to the individual small projects. Um, and the expectation also that we would build a um, multidisciplinary search discovery system um, was not possible to fulfill with an operational budget. If you just have a budget to operate systems and not develop anything new, you can't develop that level of, of new architecture. So that was um, were the, the main challenges that we encountered. And what we learned from it was we need to reduce the complexity of our operations. We need to adjust and better leverage what's already being developed out there. We don't need to develop multidisciplinary search and discovery when others are already doing it, be it EarthCube, be it Data One, and so on. Why do we need to invest uh, here? And we needed to enhance opportunities to build better partnerships for the actual disciplinary systems so that we could better serve these communities. So the future, what has come out of it is AIDA will end next year as the cooperative agreement as the NSF funded facility. But because of the success of the individual systems within their communities, these systems will continue to exist. exist. It's just a different management structure now. Um, and we will actually maintain AIDA as an alliance of the partners locally that just operate in a much more independent manner. So um, 
I think it's it's a story a bit of 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 a failure that has been very disappointing for everybody who has invested uh, into it. But it's also a story that has a good outcome because the services will continue and I continue and I think in a better manner. Okay, with that, I hand over to Leslie. If anybody has a question to that now. Where's the presentation folder? Where is it? The presentation folder. Well, not a question so much, uh, Kirsten, but um, as a former member of your advisory board <laughs> for AIDA, I, I share in some of the uh, blame and uh, angst over the, uh, the the failure to a great extent there. And uh, I guess I'd like to just honor you for standing up and sharing your failure with us and being willing to be honest about you know what happened and take a strong look at it and uh, lead this community in an effort to continue building this failure cluster or whatever it ends up becoming um, as we you know figure out where this thing goes next um, and you know I think that to a great extent your ambition and your vision for what geoinformatics and what informatics needs to become um, um, was simply too large for the container in which you were trying to achieve it uh, to a great extent. And I, I very much resonate with that because I've also been a square peg in a round hole for, uh, for quite a bit of time. So thank you very much for helping to lead thank this you, forward. Thank you, That makes me feel very warm and <laughs> Yes, I would like to say, I would like to echo this. Thank you very much for sharing this. I think it's a very important lesson. I, I'm still not quite sure how this lesson will apply to other similar projects. Personally, I do when a, I do I, I have the experience that when a project was too large, but I think it's a very it's a one-off judgment of where the right level of size, actually is and i'm I, so i'm i'm not quite sure this applies to i don't i don't know i i i mean i, I can i can see you know as some of the the lessons i think that can be learned by the broader community is you know i think the management that management structure that we tried to set up did not work um, in that, you know, we we were basically two PIs at the very beginning, and one of them became the the lead, and you know there was a constant tension on authority and decision making. So I would never go in that direction again with with the management structure. Um, I think it is really important for us looking forward at sort of shared infrastructure of the CDF or other activities to uh, bring multiple facilities or multiple efforts together to leave enough independence and, and authority with each one and not try to, you know, dump everything into a big box. There is a lot of sensitivities and it, it should evolve over time rather than, you know, we always called it a forced marriage in some way. So I think there are, you know, lessons that we can pull out of this that have a broader application. So Kirsten, I have a question. Um, I wonder, one of the things that I, I pulled out of that talk was the rebranding of those different data repositories into AIDA and one of the things when I thought about my own failures were when we've tried to like move the community somewhere else or like rebrand something that there's this very tricky yeah. time and I wonder how much you think that rebrand just just the rebrand part played into that failure yeah I I, I, th I mean <laughs> You know, it was a tough time the first two, three years where nobody knew what AIDA was. And it was really, really hard to actually have the elevator speech to explain what AIDA is. Um, that caused a lot of the, the tensions of the problems in, in marketing. I think it would have been much better that everybody kept their 
identity, Earth yeah. Chem, and so on. And there is, there would have been a little note saying powered by AIDA or something like that, where the new name stays in the background at the beginning, and you you let the actual effort thrive in its in its or with its original community and so on. Uh, I. I do think that that now we've actually reached a stage where AIDA is recognized as a name, and it's really sad to kind of let go in in many ways. And that's why we've talked a lot internally about, uh, you know, what's the value for us to maintain uh, the name AIDA as still, you know, that partnership that we will maintain because we will run shared infrastructure and so on. We will just all pay into a cost center rather than sharing the same budget where the fights are going on so I think those are um, maybe maybe it's worth actually getting social scientists into this and having some uh, analysis of the situation and you know write a paper about it that could help others I add one note um, which is uh, yeah, go on. a lot yeah. of this has to do with uh, how much we've invested emotionally in in <laughs> big projects like this, and I can, I'm can speaking from experience, not just listening to your presentation. Um, but the great thing there was at the end, you had achieved something, even if it wasn't what, or what you may have dreamed it could have been, and thus was a failure, you still ended up with something that is going to continue and that made a difference and will make a difference ongoing. And I think that's important. I know it's important for me to remember that, yeah, sometimes the outcome you get isn't what you wanted and you you hurt. Um, but you did get something and we move forward with that. Thank you. Okay, so um, as some of you know, I've been around a long time and there's been quite a few failures. So trying to work out what was the most epic of all of them, I thought this one's the best one. <laughs> Okay, so back in the 1980s, and this is really relevant to what someone said about know the time that you're working in, we had a centralised relational database system based on Oracle. They were compliant with the fifth normal form. I probably don't even remember what that was. We had controlled vocabularies in every field. There were simple, slick UIs for data entry. It cost a fortune in licences and people to manage them, but it was the cost recovery era, so it helped offset costs. So the system wasn't a failure. It ran and it operated beautifully, but it didn't last. Cost recovery ended. We went information free. And the minute you do that, um, people don't tend to pay as much attention to quality. That's just a slide, slide story. The scientists revolted. They claimed that these controlled vocabularies were stifling their scientific creativity. They wanted free text for all. We moved from a world of oracles to excellent scientists who needs database developers. We became project centric. PCs arrived. Researchers became independent and self-sufficient. Software developers took over and I had this dreadful meeting. To this day, I still remember it, where the senior managers voted as to whether the databases were going to become all free text or half free text. And I was told at the start that Control vocabularies was not an option. And failure then became an option. And so I often thought, oh my God, this whole world I had was just smashed. And I found this trawling around the web one day and it was the cost of a hard drive per gigabyte. And so in the 1980s, it was a million bucks to store a gigabyte if you could even find a storage system that stored a gigabyte. So when I travel around and I see young people picking up on these stands, these two gig thumb drives, you got $2 million in your pocket, young lady. But anyway, that's another story. And so it sort of shows we had this mentality of the world moved on and we missed it. A couple of other tools that made it so much easier for the scientists to become feral and go their own way was Excel appeared. Can you imagine a world without Excel? It was, it was interesting. Cost recovery ended and the PC became more affordable. So off they went on their own. 
And so I kind of drew this failure diagram of the tension triangle between the researcher, the data professionals and the software engineers. And in those days, because everything was so expensive, we actually had to sit in a room and work together. But we ended up in this epic fail because when you gave everyone independence, no one was able to work together because they had all this freedom and they could do all this stuff and all this free text was really great till the FAIR principles came in and machine learning and things like that where you had to be able to interoperable and machine readable, etc. And so I'm not sure whether we're still in failure mode or what. But I kind of ask if we have this tension triangle, which I think is the tensions that start to lead to failures, will this bring us back to an environment where machine to machine interchange of information will make us go back to some of that rigor and collaborativeness that we had in those eras 20 or 30 years ago? But anyway, that's my epic fail, watching a whole system just go, Pfft. thank you. Questions or comments for Leslie? Stunned silence. I know that history kind of moves in cycles. Do you think we're now back to closer to where we were in the 80s? Well, People ask, why is an old fart like me still traveling around? Because all those skills that we had 30, 40 years ago in controlled vocabularies and in structuring information are the same as what you need to be able to develop ontologies, machine readability, etc. And I have a wealth of stories that say, don't go down that path because this is what happens. Because you're pushing people into, as your talk showed, much more logical thinking and structuring and that was the skills we had in the 80s in order to be able to do those relational models. And somebody said something about AI. Well, again, AI is coming back in again because now we've got technology, we've got computer power and the capability to do it. So I think, yeah, it is starting to come together because we're starting to see some forms of um, centralization and agreements on ontologies and things that you need to move forward. Whereas when we went into the free text world of PCs and Excel spreadsheets, you didn't need it. Well, with natural language processing, uh, pretty soon we're going to be able to just have all and AI. We're going to have all free text, and we'll just the machines will just figure it out, and so we don't need to worry about it. That's the story we often hear. So that's what I'm saying. You're going to see it cycle back again. But to date, from what I've seen, yes, you can do that easily within a discipline. It's when you start to do the, particularly the transdisciplinary work and bring in the social scientists that it actually starts to become incredibly hard. Well, then you just hook in the ontologies. Yeah, but you've developed the ontologies. So you've had to have some collaboration to develop those in the first place. Whereas in the free text era, it was just every man for himself. Okay? And I think we are coming back to having to have something, even the AI is going to have to have the ontologies to work on and who's going to work out what that language is of all our scientific disciplines, kind of like what Kirsten had. She was trying to develop things cross dis well, cross-discipline within the geoscience domain. Just imagine what it's like when you start trying to bring in the social science data. Um, so, uh, social, um, well, uh, psychotherapists and other therapists have a, a, a statement who do group therapy. They have a statement that, you know, one, one patient um, throws up and every other patient wretches sort of uh, response to that. So, um, in the nature of um, continuing the, the, uh, the, the self-effacement and, you know, sharing failures and that sort of thing, um, you know, I, I've had a number of those over my um, somewhat long career as well. Aaron's nodding her head, thank you. Um, 
and it, one of them that this this reminds me of quite a bit. I mean, when when we were building um, a repository that's now taken off pretty well in USGS called ScienceBase a number of years ago, we had a bunch of huge failures because we had this big ambition to be this thing for everybody in USGS to use. It was going to be the the trusted repository before we had the idea of a trusted digital repository and that sort of thing. And and so I was constantly right. out trying to get people to be part of this thing. My understanding, according to sources who are knowledgeable of these things, is those efforts have been affected. Anyway, there we go. Um, that was a fail, a slight fail. So, so we were constantly under pressure to kind of sell this idea and get a bunch of people involved. And, and you know, I was constantly getting in front of the the big names, the big groups around the agency that were going to, you know, be a part of this and try to convince them that they needed to come along and do this thing. And and they immediately got into it and they found one flaw after another. Oh, well, this is not going to do that thing or it's not going to fix this part over here. And, you know, so they went away. And, you know, as a government person who was trying to sell a program, I got in all kinds of trouble every time this happened. I mean, my bosses were getting mad at me and saying, hey, you're not providing services that these people need. And, you know, why, why aren't you doing this well? And, you know, so it was this constant pressure of that. But then eventually those people came back. They went out and they tried to do it on their own. And then they turned around and they came back once we got a little bit further down the road and got some things done. So I think to a great extent in in much of our um, much of the work that we do, we're all salespeople. We're all, we're all trying to sell an idea. We're trying to sell a tool. We're trying to move some things along. And I think we have to realize in all sales, you're not going to make every sale. In fact, you're not going to sell a lot of what you try to put out there. Um, you're going to fail time and time again with that. And so when we're trying to sell new ideas, when we're trying to push some things along, um, investing heavily in the few early adopters that are willing to go along, being willing to let lots and lots of other sales go out the door when when somebody doesn't like our idea, and uh, building an idea that eventually will come around once some of those early adopters build on it is a key um, lesson, at least, that I've tried to learn in, in doing these things, and I think it's something we always have to come back to. Um, I couldn't agree more. In Australia, we call them the cows, the coalition of the willing. Find your cows and you'll be able to milk lots of systems for a longer time. Steve, do you have... Okay. Steve, do you want did me you to wanna... babble some? <laughs> did you have something to add? I, I, I love talking about failure. So, um, and, and maybe... We're getting that. We're getting ready to segue into some sort of global lessons or, or whatever, but I, I wanted to throw out are, are there some variables or drivers that affect the outcomes along axes that range from dismal failure at one end to raging success story at the other end? And j just by way of example, um, I think one variable is whether there is a shared vision in the project team or the community of what success represents or not. And I, over and over again with failures that I've been involved in, I've realized afterwards, well, there wasn't a shared vision of what the outcome was supposed to be. Uh, you know, it, it's the week of the moon landing celebration. Everyone had pretty much a clear shared vision that success is we land a man on the moon and hopefully we also bring him back. Uh, so there, there was clarity there um, in terms of the vision for success that that really drove people to do pretty amazing things. So that's one thing. Communications has come up over and over again. When communications are poor in the project environment, that can make a big difference. Or good communications, you know, could be a positive driver, bad communications, a, a negative driver. Is the project kind of catching the wave of evolutionary forces or riding riding the wave or is it lagging behind or is it you know too far in front where it's 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 just not going to make it um i think we've talked a lot about do we learn or can we learn from the failure mm -hmm. um at, at, and it, it it's much worse of a failure if there isn't applied learning that results from it I, I thought the discussion about 
is it a zero sum environment or not was a very interesting one. Um, yeah, if it's a sports game, you know, only one team is going to win the World Cup. Um, but does this project need to be a, a zero sum kind of a project? Maybe it does. Incentives. Um, what kind of incentive structure is in place? Are there incentives for um, positive incentives and, and maybe negative incentives? Is, is there a meaningful incentive structure? Um, one other kind of failure, um, you could argue that the Apollo program was a failure in the sense that it was sort of what I'd call resting on your laurels. Um, we did land people on the moon and then it was done. <laughs> and uh, there was a kind of a, a really logical progression onward. And more in our context, I, I can point to, I won't name the EPA project, <laughs> but um, there was an EPA database project that started out as kind of a, ahead of its time did some cool things that hadn't been done before to try to integrate data. And then after the initial success, they rested on their laurels and they didn't continue to evolve and take advantage of new technologies that were coming along. They rested on their laurels and became, you know, something that actually was almost an anchor that dragged things down. So I think yeah. resting on your laurels is something to be very careful about. And I think there's, that's a tension with the maintainers of maintaining something doesn't just mean maintaining at its sort of status quo, but that there's also as technology progresses or our understanding progresses that, you know, there's maintaining with that as well. Um, nice. So I was the third convener in this um, trio of three musketeers. <laughs> um, and so the the failures that I wanted to talk about are around the ESIP wiki and ESIP just is finishing up an organizational evaluation. Um, and one of our, I think, biggest points of feedback has been around the technology that we have supporting the community. So I just wanted to touch on two that I've seen um, and worked on personally. And I feel like maybe I, I'm breaking the rules a little bit talking sort of uh, <laughs> as as ESIP. <laughs> um, but so this first one, this is um, a data space page that I created when I was in graduate school. And I had this idea that we were going to bring structured metadata together with unstructured metadata, that we were going to have all kinds of um, information available to the user, that they were going to love it. <laughs> um, I think it gets to, you know, to Karen's point of building things that people may not have really wanted. Um, and, but it also, I think when I've, I've been listening today, one of the things was, you know, it wasn't embedded into the scientists that I wanted to adopt their workflow. It was somewhere different. They were needing to use a different technology that they didn't know. Um, they were not asking for it. Um, we didn't do a very good job of explaining. And I think there was also a point that was brought up about being ahead of its time and knowing the time that you're working in. So this was 2000, Three, 2004, you know, Amazon was was becoming very popular as a bookseller and the Amazon book pages were really our model for creating this, but it, Amazon wasn't what Amazon is today. Um, and, and since then, there's been a lot of work on user feedback. So really my goal in all of this had been to connect the user feedback to, um, to the structured metadata from the provider and, you know, linking unintended users back to the providers because providers wanted to know who else was using their data. And I was an example of an unintended user. And I think that it's really interesting, you know, that FAIR has become such a, a mantra for our community and that reusable and interoperable are two of those components because this work was some of that making data more interoperable and more reusable for other people and even making the metadata about it more interoperable and reusable. So I think while it was a failure in its creation um, and, you know, even in the way that it's um, it's survived over time, you know, there are things that we haven't maintained in the wiki that are now broken. There are links that are broken. Um, it's sort of remarkable that any of these services are still returning images um, and that as much of it is still working as as it is, um, but this is one of I would say that this is a you know a big a big failure for me. 
I think the other thing, so the wiki has been around since the early 2000s for ESIP, um, and it has survived time. It's very cheap for us to run. Um, we pay, I think, almost zero hosting cost for it. Um, we've, you know, we've updated it over time, but um, it's basically just chugged along. And for about the first 10 years that we had the wiki, all collaboration areas were using the wiki as their collaborative workspaces. And so another thing that we um, we created, that I created, um, let's see if we can get to it, um, was this kind of standard landing page, and you will know it when you see it. Um, it's really ugly. Um, I would not say that that's a fail. Uh, this is a feature. <laughs> I'm kidding. It's 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 so ugly. Um, and but it was this pattern that was repeated over and over by many clusters that were um, working within ESIP. And even when we were siloed, we still were on the same wiki. And so there was just the like potential that you know you might, as you search the wiki for something, find something that you didn't intend to find or didn't know was going on. Um, things like notes were, um, you know, we can look at these telecon notes from 2011. They're not great notes, but look, all from 2009, 2008, we had telecon notes on the wiki. And so we can go back and we can search the history of the wiki and then it stops, right? This cluster actually um, is on hiatus is what we call it. Um, but other clusters have also stopped taking notes on the wiki. And that stopping taking notes on the wiki, really I think we could see where Google Docs comes in. Google Docs was easy. Google Docs were quick to start. Anybody could edit them in real time. That was a challenge with the wiki. There was one editor at a time. The editing was clumsy. Um, you had to know like some pretty weird notations, but not any any weirder than you know markup. Um, and it was, you know, but there was there was a little bit of a barrier to entry here that Google Docs did not have. But Google Docs are now spread all over this community, and they're everywhere, and everybody owns them. And so there's not a single way to search. There's not, you know, we're losing all kinds of knowledge from this community. So I think that that's, I would say that that's a much bigger fail in my mind. And that's, I guess, where Kirsten, you know, I feel like it's not exactly my fail, but it, it, you know, I don't know what to do about it, and I'm pretty alarmed. And so I'm bringing it up here, and I'm hoping that maybe somebody has thoughts on where we go or ideas. We'll leave it there. Thank you, Eric. Any, any, yeah, there are some. Hi, Erin. Hello. Hi, um, <laughs> um, this is something that I, I'm concerned about. I don't have the answer either, but with information management and sharing in my part of NOAA organization, and like you, we had wikis, and I loved them, and I still love them. <laughs> but now there's like there's Google, there's GitHub, there's a whole bunch of other things, and we're getting all these other options that could be just as wonderful, but they're they're coming and going. And um, one of the things that, and, and there's no one technology choice right now by our organization that says, this is the platform that we mm -hmm. shall all use to have our shared minutes of documentation on. And it's challenging, but I think that within a certain, you just have to pick one. Yeah. And then, <clears throat> provide training on it. And I think that that's, that's yeah. one of the things I've started doing when trying to get people to migrate from one platform to another is start a meeting. This is how we do it. This is how we use it. Here's how, where the resources are. Mm. And that just becomes a part, <clears throat> excuse me, just a part of how you start a meeting is introducing the platform that you're using and the resources. Yeah, I like the norms idea of and the training piece of things. Other? Other thoughts, Sky? So um, I went to my first ESIP 101 meeting today. I had never been to one, um, so that was kind of cool. Uh, Carl remarked on that afterwards. He, you know, said something about you know waiting for years to get me into an ESIP 101. But um, 
no, I thought it was kind of interesting in there when when a couple of things came up from uh, folks who attended that asking about, well, you know, where do I go to get information on the clusters and how yeah. those are working? And it's always been sort of interesting that in this community of people who really are in the business of information management, that our information management space is so, you know, messy and crazy yeah. and it's got all kinds of stops and starts and everything else. But you know, that's just kind of the nature of those things. You know, I tried to do something like this in USGS years ago called My USGS, and to some extent, that's been an epic fail in a lot of ways. It's been great in other ways. We're in the fourth generation of different technologies like this to use. We're now still using the Atlassian suite of things to kind of help people document what they're doing and everything else, but it never realized the vision that I had for it way back when of being the space where all of a sudden people would magically discover everything else that everybody was doing and have these wonderful recommender systems that help them, you know, make connections across the community and everything else. Yeah. So Carl's response this morning in ESIP 101, and I think uh, Megan's response in there as well, was that, you know, somehow or the other, there's lots of information created and developed through relationships and conversations that will never find its way into you know, a structured information space, no matter how good it is or, mm -hmm. you know, what tool you pick or, you know, anything else to try to make it happen. So, um, you know, I think sometimes the lesson learned is don't beat your head against the wall trying to, you know, create the absolute perfect system when the perfect system is never going to exist anyway. Just keep providing the tools, putting them out there for people, being critical of them, introspecting how they're going and uh, coming up with new things and new methods over time. Uh, but continue to focus on the parts of communication and the parts of communication infrastructure that actually work and mm -hmm. that actually um, achieve those uh, end results that maybe the tech tools are never going to do anyway. Yeah, nice. Um, okay, we have 15 minutes left and I think there's a couple of things. So first of all, in Australia, we kind of have a companion conference called eResearch Australasia. And we actually ran this epic failure session for about four years. And so that's one thing to throw out to you as to whether, when I mean, there's 60 of you minimum in this room, is this something worth continuing? But in order to make it continue, you've got to have something that we can carry on with. And you'll each see a note post-it note and we don't want to call this failures or negative results. Uh, I think uh, what's a positive title? So can you put that on it? And I think to start off with, can we call this lessons learned? And then also as we invited you and somebody said they're going to run out of the room because they didn't want to do it, um, just give you an opportunity to write something down that you feel was something that did not go right but what you learned and maybe uh, attach it to close to the papers over there or just stick it on the wall full stop. Um, but then ask if you any ideas like someone, we have had a lot of interest in this session and a few emails floating around. Um, someone even floated the idea of could we have a bit of a, was it a blog post or something where, you know, we just start to have people compile and come more out in the open. But that word is the lessons of history will be repeated if we do not know about them. So how do we let people know about them and stop people going down blind alleys that you yourself know you've been down? And because you haven't spoken out, someone else is now going through the pain. And I don't know about the rest of you, I don't find that very satisfac satisfying to watch. So on the post-its, are you prepared to, um, what would we do? Could you, a lesson learned. But also, if you're interested, put your email address on. <laughs> Because if you do agree that starting a blog or something like that's worth having. So actually, why don't we divide it into two options and you're not leaving the room till you've done one or the other. Shush. <laughs> 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 My nickname in Australia, she just mentioned it, but you didn't hear it. 
Um, so either put an epic lesson up there on the wall, which should be over near there, or if you've got an idea of how, how can we bring this together? Is it a blog post or is it what? How do we share the lessons learned? As Kirsten, you showed the journals that... Um, um, one, one of the ideas that came to my mind in the course of these discussions is um, potentially even a, let's say, a special issue of some journal on this particular issue. So it's not a single article that appears somewhere and says, oh, this doesn't work, but it's a whole set of articles that, you know, could, could bring these lessons learned from... Um, you know, things that didn't go the way they were planned to, uh, together into a, a a collection of of lessons. I mean, that that would would be one possibility. So write up an idea of that you have. Is it about the blog? Is it about publications? Is it about uh, you know another session at the next ESIP meeting and, and so on? Uh, what would you prefer to? How how would you like the con the the discussion to continue? Or do you not think it's worth continuing this discussion? I mean, that's that's another statement that we need to know. I think. <laughs> oui. <laughs> so again, how you would like to or how you would like to if you would like to And Ilya is going to is it Ilya? Yeah, he's gonna stand at the door and nobody's getting out <laughs> unless they put a post it note either near the white sheets or further down which is the ideas. Ilya, will you please do your... No, don't sit down. Get at the door, please. Sorry, and someone locked the other door. Michael, do your duty as Vice President of ESIP. We are determined this session will not be an epic of failure. We need concrete evidence that it worked. So, and I, I promise that we're actually going to synthesize all the feedback and put it up.
Awesome. 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 I see. I see a lot of colors on the wall. Good. And you know, before you start leaving, I just wanted to say thank you for everybody who came and who is now contributing, even if it's sort of in a forced way. <laughs> So I think, you know, as people are putting things up, go ahead, Emily. Um, we have Seek and Nurture, A Champion, Unexpected Opportunities for Change, Never Underestimate the Potential for Conflict that Cultural Differences Can Cause. Uh, proposed Changes Not with Major, Met with Major Resistance from Another Team. <laughs> 